when recovery seems impossible. In 1986, Ray Lewis Thornton received what she believed at the time anyway was a death sentence. She had been diagnosed with AIDS. What seemed like the likely end was actually the beginning of a 36-year journey of self-discovery, forgiveness, and recovery, one that has led Ray to understanding, acceptance, and activism. Join me and the triumphant Ray Lewis Thornton in the arena right now. Three, two, one. Ray, I have been looking forward to this from the moment I saw your story and was reminded of how you had already come into my life back in 94 on the cover of Essence. Um, when I was this little recent graduate in this emerging world of HIV and AIDS, is it a white gay man's disease, who is it impacting? And then in our community, we saw that cover of Essence. So. I remember when you and I had our pre-interview, I just finished reading your book the night before, mm -hmm. and I apologize because I think my first words to you were, you owe me back eight hours of sleep because when I finished this, I could not, I could, and I keep saying heartbreakingly triumphant. Um, and I think I said to you during the conversation, if I root for anybody's happy ending, it's yours. I mean, and we'll walk through it, but you have been fighting from birth. So, and, and I'm gonna give a, uh, the warning you gave to me um, in the book, which was the correct one. Again, there may be triggers in this section for some of you. In fact, intermittently throughout the book are scenes that may be a trigger. As you read my story, take some breaks, have a cup of coffee, be kind to yourself. Not only is that right for your book, but that seems like a, a good approach for life. It is. Yeah. You know, I, um, you know, I'm an avid reader. <clears throat> and you know from the book, I didn't read my first book until I was 13. I'm mm. an avid reader. And sometimes, you know, we jump into these stories and we don't really know what they're going to be. Mm. And I wanted um, people to know that it's a, it's, a good story, it's a sad story, um, and there are a lot of painful things that you're gonna learn about me. Yeah. Things that were done to me, and things that were done that I did to myself. Mm -hmm. And it may resonate with someone's own life, and so I wanted people to be prepared. Yeah, it was, a, it was the best <laughs> advice. Um, let's start at the beginning. You were born prematurely in Chicago on May 22nd, 1962. Both of your parents, your black father and white mother, were drug addicted. Um, when you were an infant, your paternal grandfather, your father's father, took you in, took you from your parents and began raising you. By the time you were three, your father, your biological father had been killed. Tell me about Mama. Mama is the woman who you speak to as, as your mother. She played that role. She's the lead character. Yes, oh, Mama. Mama, in my book. Mama is prominent. I just it want to lean book. into Mama and, is, yeah. And you love her some days and you hate her some days. And um, um, I'm thinking about actually doing a fictional book on Mama. Mama's a book um, on her own. Okay, so let me just correct you for a okay. moment. I was born in Buffalo, New York. Ah, okay. Uh, and my parents were both heroin addicts. Mm. The way my mother put it was, and I didn't meet my mother until I was 18, mm. um, said that they were two junkies getting together. Mm. And sometime after my first birthday, my paternal grandfather took me 
to raise me. So after that first birthday, some, somewhere between one and two, he took me from my parents. My father was shot in um, the back of his head by his first cousin. It was an accidental shooting. Uh, and I learned the details through the research because I had always been told one story. Mm. And um, I learned the truth. He was 31 years, so he had just turned 31. My goodness. And um, so <clears throat> my grandfather um, married this woman to help him raise his child. His grandbaby, you know, like old was men that do. the foundation on which the marriage? Oh, was absolutely! Wow, absolutely. He and was fifty-two. She was thirty, something like that. And we're I talking about remember. mama now. Mama, and so um, um, he died when I was six years old, and no one wanted me. Hmm. Well, not quite true, I found out. But mama told me every day, nobody wanted your little white ass. Mm -hmm. um, and I believed it. And, and you'll meet my Aunt Lula May in the book. She's my, my grandmother's mother. My grandmother died early in her life. And, uh, you know, I told you I was, um, I started Ancestry when I started writing the book because when I, when I read my grandfather's obituary at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. when I started working on the book, I realized that his mother and two sisters were still alive and I never met them. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know what happened to me? Why did people desert me? Mm -hmm. So mama was it. And for better or worse. For better or worse. And she was um, a functional alcoholic. She went to work every single day. Housekeeper? Maid. Okay. Um, she didn't do people's houses. She did hotels. Okay. Um, she cooked a meal. She came home from work after cleaning toilets all day cooked me dinner. And those were some of the moments, I, I remember from the book, I could visualize it right now, those are the moments you felt closest to mama. You know, um, right after my grandfather's death, the most, well, actually the most intimacy I ever had with her mm. was watching her cook, mm. you know? And it seemed like mm. there was magic mm. in those hands, the way she, uh, stirred the cornbread. The, the way, way you she describe her is onions. so loving. I mean, I, it's she just, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, but those same hands that made these incredible mm. meals also beat me. Yeah. Beat me because the sun was shining, beat me because the sun didn't shine, yeah. beat me, beat yeah. me, beat me. Told me most days of my life that I was never going to be anything. Yeah. And so I was physically, emotionally, mm. uh, physically and emotionally abused. Um, she never told me she loved me. In your, in your lifetime? In my life. I think I tell one story in the afterwards where I give a, like a roll of the credits where I talk about everybody uh, and what happened. Um, she was in the hospital. She had cancer of the mouth. I mm. was the only person taking care she of her. She was a heavy smoker. She, You'll find that in the Chang. book. Yeah, yeah, that's another was, visual. Yeah, that's I another from the book. visual yeah. of Mama, and um, she had cussed me for the last day that day, and I and I got ready to leave. I was like, I'm I'm done, Mama. You could just can't keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I made it to the door, she said, "Don't go. I love you. Mm -hmm. Use all I got." Mm -hmm. And and I kept walking. Yeah. Do you, do you... But I came back the next day. Okay. Uh, you came back a lot. Um, and, and, and we, who among us, you, it's the core of your being, um, for better or for worse. You know, um, Jennifer Lewis, I think it's Jennifer Lewis, says if you shit, if you sit and shit long enough, um, you, you, you don't smell it. 
And I think for all of us, it is, you came into the world the way you came into the world. Your parents, you didn't meet your mom until 18, never met your father. Your paternal grandfather brought you on, and then this woman who is not a blood relation um, is raising you. And she's doing, some would say, the best she could. Roof over your head, food in your stomach, but the nourishment you needed is for our spirit and sense of self. Because the number of times that woman called you white bitch, yellow bitch, the, 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 uh, two things resonated and I, I have to imagine that that was deep trauma that impacted so much your relationships. Um, you were told you were fast from the beginning. You, from the, you were, what, four, five, six, and that was already being embedded in you. It was already being embedded And you were called a bitch me. almost every day. I was called a bitch almost every day. And what was so um, crazy about the madness in my house um, I, I, I have one scene in here, my freshman year of high school, where she wakes me up at 5 o'clock in the morning to find her hairbrush. Mm. And she's screaming at me, bitch, find my brush. I'm going to beat your ass. You better find your brush, my brush. And um, she goes into the pantry. She comes back. Um, of course, I know she sips her liquor in the pantry. She comes back, and she throws cold water in my face that she has just chased with the alcohol and I just I just pray mm. I mean I just pray because I knew that I was going to get the shit beaten out of me that morning mm. and God said look in the purse the hairbrush was in her handbag and I gave it to her and she said oh I thought you had it mm. and I had to pull myself together and go to school and be normal. Uh, and when you became I came very home, good at I did. being Wait, normal. Just say, when I came back yeah. home that evening, because I had a part-time job, that leather coat that I had been waiting, that I had been begging for was there waiting for me. So it, it, that was the confusion. Mm. She beat me in the morning and brought bags of clothes home every payday. She told me to do something or she was going to beat me and then she beat me when I did mm. what she told me to do and that was the kind of trauma and chaos I lived until the day she put me out at 17. And on top of all of that trauma and chaos there is a theme of men abusing you from a, a ridiculously young age. It was multiple times before that you were even remotely at the age of consent that men were assaulting or flat out raping as you as you describe in your book how uh, talk about your your faith and whatever got you through the combination of mama and just being violated it felt like you were being violated in every corner of your life there was no safe space you know what um i talk about this in the book how i had been told that i was fast so much and all i knew i knew that touching was being fast. Mm -hmm. And I talk about how this term is used for young girls, but it's never used for boys. Mm -hmm. So when my stepbrother started molesting me, um, I knew if I told that I would get my butt beat, but I didn't know if he would get beat. Mm -hmm. And so I kept wanting to know, I kept saying, why are these people making me be fast? Mm. Like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's mm. wrong with me? It's I'm like, I yeah. just, you know, by the time I was 20, I knew I was just so broken. 18, I was broken. Mm. And, and that brokenness went into um, how I actually interacted okay. with men as a young adult. And I tell people all the time that little girls with low self-esteem grew up to be women with low self-esteem. And so mm. being so rejected and mm. so abused, mm. I was searching for any attention. Craving. Yeah. So when my stepbrother started showing me attention, watching the TV with mm. me, um, popping popcorn with me, talking to me, it was like our special relationship. Mm. You know, and I and I because show you don't you, know what love looks like. Because I don't know what love has looked like, and I tr this is my big brother. I trust him, yeah. and he's spending time with me when no one else is spending time with me, <sighs> and then he starts touching, and you know, 
It doesn't matter who touches the clit. It feels good. The body will fail you. The body fails you. And I didn't understand that. But, but by the time he went from touching the thigh to touching me with my panties on to touching me with, you know, my panties pulled to the side yeah. to by the time he penetrated, I was so already locked into the secret mm. and so confused because I yeah. didn't want him to stop loving me, but I knew he was hurting me at the same time. And I, I didn't know how he, yeah. and I talk about this and I, and I describe it and I work yeah. through it. I mean, I yeah. literally had to sit there and relive every episode. And he wasn't the only one. And I want to say what happens is predators know. Mm. You know, so it wasn't just... Um, and I don't know that my stepbrother was a predator in the sense. I think what he was was a, a young man whose penis was hard mm. and saw an opportunity, and he went for it, mm. and he kept going for it, and he kept going yes. for it. And he rationalized because he wasn't my blood. Wow. I'm going to move to, because there's so much to cover in these 60 years that you're still living. Ah! And with everything that you brought into young adulthood, you began at Southern Illinois, your, your, your career in politics, and you had a career, you have a career in politics. It started with the Black Affairs Council, then you were working on the campaign for Harold Washington, that yes. historic campaign. Then you were two times on the national campaign for Reverend Jesse Jackson. Yes. And underneath all of this was at some point during that you were diagnosed. Yes. So How did you find out about that? Okay. So um, I organized students um, to work uh, on election day, seven busloads of students from SIU to come to Chicago on election day mm. for Harold Washington. And long and short of it, I got put in leadership position. All the students were at push. And at the end of the day, uh, Reverend Tyrone Kreider, who's deceased now, said, hey, I want to give you an internship. Mm. And he gave me an internship, and I came. And I, and I knew that what I didn't have a name for what I was doing, mm. but I, I believed that this was my calling. Um, and, and to tell you how the, the circle of life fits in, I had heard Reverend Jackson preach a Sunday sermon at my church in Evanston mm -hmm. um, when I was 14. And he talked about Jesus Christ as a suffering servant. And I thought, this is, God has a purpose for my life. I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. And, you know, here I am at Operation Push as an intern, you know, I'm working on the Anheuser-Busch boycott, and I work 10, 12-hour days as an intern, mm -hmm. and I get, they asked me to stay on, and I went to D.C., and it was the Deputy National Youth Director for the presidential campaign, for his 84 presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. Went back to school, came back to D.C. to get my career as a political organizer going. I had a dream, mm -hmm. you know, set for me. Um, and I just got my life like Come on, on yeah. target. I had my own apartment. I was like mm. being healthy. I, and then I get diagnosed with HIV. And how did you find out? I donated blood and the Red Cross told me I was infected. In fact, I organized the blood drive mm. because there had been an Amtrak accident in Northern Virginia and there had been deaths, and there had been news reports of how people were afraid to donate blood because of HIV, mm. and I thought, how absurd. And I organized this blood drive, and what I thought was a thank you letter was a letter telling me that something was wrong. wrong. At 24? At 24. When you finally believed you were getting My your life chance. together. I was living healthy. I, Because, you know, mm. you'll get through that period from 17 to... Mm. 22, you go Ooh. like, Woo, <laughs> You thank girl. goodness for it. There's no social media or yes. pictures. Ooh, yes. yes. So you thought, yeah, and you this is, you were having there. an amazing experience that I you was, had to claw your way to. This wasn't handed to you. No, I had to claw my way. I worked hard. And so I came back to Chicago in 88, 
um, to work on the, as the national youth director for Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign. I organized students across the country for the mm -hmm. campaign. I'm very proud of. I talk very, I talk about um, both campaigns and what they meant for me and what they meant for America because yeah. Reverend Jackson has been locked out of history in a lot of ways. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I come back with HIV, and so I'm working on the campaign. I'm you're, living you're in these secret. These whole lives, um, I'm reading your yeah. book, and you are out there every day, the star, shiny, well dressed, put together, and you are taking for anyone who knows. The original drug was ACT, which ACT. was just toxin and a pill. It's days I couldn't hold my body up. Yeah. And I. And yet you work national campaigns. I work national campaigns. Mm. And I took that medicine and I took that medicine. And um, it still didn't stop me from transitioning to AIDS. Mm. I, I transitioned to AIDS and I was still working. I was still doing, yeah. you know, the work because I believe God had a plan for mm. my life and you know enriching the lives of our people yeah. was what I was going to do. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something Ray I knew this was going to happen we have barely scratched the surface uh. of your incredible life. Um, I knew as we were going to sit here and start these conversations I wanted to set the the pace with, with someone like you sitting in this chair. I'm gonna ask you right now, and I'm gonna do it on the air so you have no choice. I need you to come back and continue oh, the conversation. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Perfect, stay right there. We'll be right back with Three for the Road. I'm Michelle Skinner. I'm Angelique David. And I'm Robin McFarland. You can think of me as the Beyonce of the group. Each week, Real Talk with the Just for Girlfriends will serve up fun, facts, and real conversation for the soul. We'll be joined by an incredible array of guests exploring issues and topics designed to enlighten, entertain, and sometimes even unnerve. Real Talk with Just for Girlfriends airs Mondays on CanTV19 and streaming on CanTV.org. So, Ray. Our crafty team behind In the Arena has come up with our final segment, and it is called, wait for it, Three for the Road. Okay. And they are made up of three questions, and I pick the three, and you answer them. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Question number one. If you could have dinner with any person, living or dead, who would you choose and why? Harriet Tubman. Now tell me the why. Because she fought for our people hmm. when they didn't even know that they needed to, that they needed her. And so um, just her boldness to go back into slavery and bring mm. people home and her willingness to put a gun to a person's head and say, hmm. you either going to be free mm -hmm. or you going to die. How about that? What was that that she said, I could have freed more? If, if they had known they were slaves. Mm, my, my. Okay. Good start. Okay. Ready for the second one? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> favorite curse word. Oh, we go from the secular to the... To Wait, the I like to mix it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a tie between fuck and bitch. Okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. And people say I cuss too much. I cuss no. like a sailor. No. Yeah. I find that important. That would be lying. I, <laughs> you're passionate. I got kicked out of my sorority because I said that the executive director was talking to me like a bitch on the street on oh. Twitter. Okay, oh, I've heard, on. There's a, I, okay, I'm going to move <laughs> on. Okay. Um, final question. One piece of advice 60-year-old Ray would have given her 21-year-old self. Breathe. Mm. Breathe. It's breathe. Because 
I was always on high alert. That's what trauma does. My cortisone levels were high. I was always in a state of fight or flight. Mm. And by the time I made decisions and the information was at the intelligent part of my brain, it was like, oh, shit, I did that again. Uh -huh. And so I would tell myself, breathe, child. Mm. Just breathe. calm down, breathe. Ray Lewis, I am just mesmerized by talking with you. Um, your life really is the absolute title of this episode, and that is Triumph Over Trauma. Um, you have done amazing things despite the odds, maybe sometimes because of it. I think we all have a purpose in the journey. Absolutely. Yeah. Ray and I are going to continue our conversation. Thank you. Let me start You're there. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Ray, thank you. My sincere thanks to Ray Lewis Thon for agreeing to be my very first guest tonight. And thank you, Chicago and Beyond, for joining me in the arena tonight. Ray and I are going to continue this conversation on In the Arena Extra. It's a conversation you can find exclusively on our newly redesigned website at cantv.org. Let me leave you with one final thought for the road. In times such as these, grace is one of the best gifts you can give to yourself and to each other. Until next week, take good care of yourself, Chicago. You know, we would um, make dust ruffles and curtains together, and she taught me how to crochet, and I'm a knitter now. And at one period in the 88 campaign when I came back and I was dealing with the secret and I was just so wounded, um, and I talk about how being with Mrs. Jackson, just sitting with her, brought me back to life. I, I mean, I don't exactly I, the I, moment you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and, and so, and she didn't even know because I was living in secret. Mm. I, I didn't tell for seven years I kept my infection a secret. Mm. And I, re, I even remember the day I, I was had transitioned to AIDS and I knew I had to tell. And so I told Reverend first and we were standing in the kitchen and I said, Reverend, I got something serious to tell you. He said, you're pregnant. I was like, no, I wish. <laughs> and uh, I told him, I said, I have, a I have AIDS. And he said, you mean HIV? And I was like, no, I have mm. AIDS. And, you know, because in his mind, AIDS was dying. And he, made, he just said, stop. He said, Ray, I loved you before AIDS. Mm. I loved you with AIDS. We prayed. And he said, does Jackie know? Mm. And we went into uh, the dining room together and told Mrs. Jack.